Um, it is Wednesday, January 25th, 2023, and I would like to um, open this committee for Minnesota Education Finance. Uh, this morning we have some uh, very interesting bills before us uh, that's, that um, focus on uh, property tax levy, lease levy authorization, and um, some fund transfers, which, um, you know, I'm not that well versed on these, these different items, but I think they're important to know that um, there are different ways that we are able to support our schools um, through our public dollars. Before we get uh, we um, get going, I thought I would ask um, Ms. Hofner to explain to us a little bit about what these um, what levies are, how that works, and uh, what difference it can can make to a school district. Ms. Hofner, oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, um, oh. That's okay. I'll I'll answer it, Betsy. But um, a levy is a is a tax on property owners, um, and a lot of times these taxes are used to pay specific causes for school districts, or there are several levies right now in school finance. We have referendum levy, which is voter approved. We have local optional revenue, uh, which is um, school board approved, and then there are um, additional levies, including equity, uh, transition, and then operating capital, which are set in statute, and a lot of the levies in education finance are equalized, uh, which means based off property wealth, uh, school district will get more aid uh, when their property wealth is lower, um, they'll receive more state aid, and then if they have higher property wealth, they'll pay more in uh, property tax levy. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I think I covered it. Um, there are equalization factors set in statute that um, list out uh, uh, what, what the district will pay. So there's a specific number, an equalization factor. And if a district falls above or below that, that's how it's calculated how much uh, state aid and levy the district will receive based off of each levy. Thank you, Ms. Helseth. I'm sorry, I got your name wrong earlier. Does anybody have a question? Um, Senator Swadzinski. Um, good morning, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Helseth, is there a possibility, because it's so complicated of an issue, it, can we, at your leisure and earliest convenience, get the definition of levy and operating levy and all this terminology that we often get in this committee, and then an anecdote or an example after the definition of, because I think I've got the definitions down, but I'm still unclear of examples that um, of those concepts. So if you, that I think the committee would love to see that um, someday, maybe in the near future. Thank you, Miss Helseth. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Swadzinski. I'd be happy to put that together and send it out to the committee members. Thank you. Senator Rarick, did you have a question or comment? Oh. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just, uh, to that, um, I was just uh, speaking with our two researchers yesterday, and they recommended a document, uh, uh, Strom, um, what's Tim, Tim Strom, Strom from, from the House, House. does. Um, it is, I started pouring through that last night. It has all of that. Uh, it is a fabulous document to go through. So I would recommend that for all the committee members. Thank you, Mr. Rarick. It is, or Senator Rarick, it is an incredible document. Um, Mr. Strom has a wealth of knowledge that I don't know, maybe all of you guys have that too, but it, he's he's got all the answers. Follow up? Yeah, yeah. Um, Senator Rarick, um, I, I have read it, and it's such, it is, it, it's compelling reading, it really is, as, as a member of this committee, and, uh, but it'd be nice to have the um, cheat sheet of that 120-page document or whatever it is, so thank you. Thank you, Senator Swazinski. Senator Lucero? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and for the, the bill author, I just want to see, do you know offhand how many school districts would be impacted by this bill? I'm not sure the bill is before the committee yet, but I will answer when it is. Yeah, and we haven't introduced it yet. I apologize. I'll yep. wait. We can give it a minute. We can get to that when the time comes. All right, any questions? All right, well, with that, then we will move on um, to hearing our bills. Our first one up is Senate File one, uh, 100, uh, Senator Uamu. 
We'll move verbatim, would you please um, make a motion to move Senate file 100? Yes, Madam Chair. I move uh, Senate file 100 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you very much. So we'll go to the author, um, Senator Klein, if you'd like to introduce your bill and um, uh, tell us a little bit about it. Well, thank you, Chair uh, Kunesh and members of the committee. Very grateful for a hearing on Senate File 100. Uh, and just a little background from my own perspective. And while I speak, I think I will ask my testifiers to join me at the table, Senator or Chair. Um, so I, if you know, I was before I was in the Senate, I was a school board member in West St. Paul. And it was a real learning experience for me to find out that uh, in West St. Paul, where we have sort of a large commercial base, we have Robert Street, you've probably driven down, and there's a Target and restaurants and a couple auto parts stores. And, and uh, our uh, tax dollar, our property tax dollar, went very far, and our schools did very well. Uh, and right across the street, my good friends in South St. Paul with a very different sort of property base, uh, their tax dollars did not go nearly as far. Uh, and. Uh, certainly not consistent with how we would hope to fund schools in the state of Minnesota and, and make sure that everybody has an equal opportunity to a great education. And so I uh, am glad to put uh, Senate file 100 before the committee. And with that, uh, with your permission, Chair Kunish, I will go to my testifiers. Please do. Well, Madam Chair, thank you very much for this opportunity, as well as members of the committee and uh, Senator Klein. My name... Sorry. My name is Brian Zambrino. I am the superintendent of South St. Paul Public Schools. Just about a year in, so um, somewhat newer to the equalization conversation, but it doesn't take long to realize just how important this conversation is. And so I appreciate this opportunity. Just a little history, and I, I'll admit I apologize if I'm preaching the choir, but just to kind of paint the picture and give the context. Um, years ago, prior to the early 70s, school funding was primarily uh, schools were primarily funded through local property taxes, and so uh, what that created was a situation where there were large disparities uh, in what schools were able to provide to their students based on the property value of their community. Um, so you saw disparities and inequities in the system, and so in 1971, legislation was passed to pull that um, obligation back to the state and really say this is not equitable, let's fund schools through the state. And that is what we hear of as the, or the Minnesota miracle, not the Minneapolis miracle, which pops up a lot if you Google search Minnesota miracle, but the Minnesota miracle was to say, let's define what education is, let's bring the funding back to the state and have a more equitable, uh, even playing field. And so our schools were pretty well funded at that time. And actually, if you look at funding in the state, as well as achievement, they really go hand in glove. And so uh, we had really high achievement, great outcomes happening in our schools. In the early 2000s, there was a big shift. So I would say the Minnesota miracle uh, pretty much uh, passed away. And so that burden then be began to shift really back to local property taxpayers. And so that's uh, put the need for uh, that coupled with the fact that um, inflation far exceeds what we get in state funding. That's a conversation we could have for hours on end. Uh, but we know that over the past decade plus, we've seen the cost of educating kids far outpacing what we get from the state. And so what that has led to do is push local communities to turn within and say, uh, and to your question, uh, Senator, uh, we need to fund our schools, let's pass an operating levy. And so if you look at South St. Paul Public Schools, uh, when I came in, we were facing a very significant, uh, significant fiscal cliff. We actually rebranded that to financial cliff to make that term more accessible to our community. But we were in a situation when I walked in the door where we're doing okay through our COVID relief funds, our ESSER dollars, but when those expire at the end of next year, we were facing a multi-million dollar budget reduction. And this, our district for context has two elementary schools, one middle, one high school. And we were looking at potentially the need to reduce as many as 35 classroom teachers. I mean, it would be utterly devastating. And so this fall, our board put two questions, two operating referendum questions to the community saying, we want to fund our schools. And these are dollars that go straight to the students. And so put that to the taxpayers. There was discussion why two was we, they weren't sure what the, the tax burden the community was willing to take on. And so uh, question one was really to cover the cost of the ESSER funds going away. And then the second question was added to say, we know that our students have great needs coming off of COVID, social, emotional, academic needs. And so they put two questions to our taxpayers. It was this very significant increase of past. Now, when you look at our community, the challenge we have um, South St. Paul, for those who don't know, is a very blue-collar, hard, working-class community, amazing community, 
they support each other, they support the communities, and that's why they stepped up to pass these operating referenda. Years ago, there were two packing meat packing plants, and that's why we're the packers, and so um, this community, that, that went away, and so what you have now is a community that is uh, largely, we have 80% of our residents approximately who have no students in our schools. So if you think of that, that's a lot of retirees on fixed income. So they voted yes to pass this operating referendum to raise their taxes, knowing full well they have no hope of raising their income, they're on a fixed income. If you look at the rest of our community, we have relatively small homes, and again, uh, a lot of families in those homes who might have sometimes more month than they have money, and yet still pass this referendum. So they, they took on this extra burden, knowing that our district needed that to be able to provide our kids education that they deserve just like every other child in the state. So we have these complicating factors of, of that as well as we're a tax poor um, community and, and Brady Hoffman's our director of finance. He'll spell out some of the challenges in the current equalization, but we are a tax poor community, meaning we have uh, a small commercial and industrial sector. So when we pass an operating referendum that is collected through property tax and because we're largely homeowners, that's who's carrying this burden as opposed to other school districts that might have a large commercial sec uh, sector. So we'll share what that means, but this is part of the, the challenge we're facing and why equalization is so important to us. Uh, and so um, we're really appreciative of this opportunity to share this conversation with you. We understand this legislation is narrow to South St. Paul, but it is part of a larger conversation that needs to happen. I think the time is now. This is an, an issue of fairness and equity, as well as property tax relief. Uh, and when you hear the numbers that Brady's going to share about the burden our property tax payers are carrying, I think you'll see that it's, it's extremely out of balance and unfair for a, a community of people who are so committed to their schools, have been forever, many on fixed incomes and many just trying to get by and carrying this burden that we hope that we can uh, address uh, some of that through the state. So again, Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity. I'll let uh, our Director of Finance, Brady Hoffman, talk through the handout we have in front of you, and then we'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Superintendent. That's really good background information. I'm really impressed that your community of um, retired folks, of, of, you know, of our elders, are looking out for the younger folks. So that's really encouraging. Uh, and so, um, uh, Mr. Hoffman, would you please introduce yourself for the record, and you may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Brady Hoffman. I am the Director of Finance for South St. Paul Schools. Um, so we do have a handout in front of you. Um, it does kind of walk through some of the equalization and the tax impacts um, for South St. Paul. As Brian said, uh, Superintendent Zambrino, um, we are considered a property poor community. Um, however, one thing with that is we have equalization that is supposed to help. Because equalization has not been attached to inflation over the years, we actually don't receive any equalization aid. So we have, our property values have outpaced those tiers. Um, our neighbors just to the west, West St. Paul, has a very high commercial tax base. So they are not in this property poor category. So um, West St. Paul is a great partner of ours. We partner with them in our community education programming. We partner with them and Invergrove Heights on some tri-district career and college readiness programming. So these are programs that wouldn't exist if we didn't have these partnerships. So they're a great um, resource for us to work with. But when it comes to the property taxes, uh, there's a great discrepancy on um, how that burden gets carried. Uh, looking at the handout, we have these two pies, these two pizza pies sitting there. If you go to West St. Paul with $10 and go buy a pizza, you can get a full pizza for that $10. If you go to South St. Paul with that same $10, you only get 27% of the pizza. That's all the further the South St. Paul dollar goes in generating um, tax dollars for our schools. Another way to look at it is the, the two bars a little bit further down. Uh, so this is taking a $250,000 home in either community, South St. Paul or West St. Paul, and the amount that that taxpayer would have to pay to generate $100,000 of revenue for the schools. In West St. Paul, they have to pay $3 a year to generate that $100,000. In South St. Paul, they have to pay $11 a year. So almost four times as much the South St. Paul homeowners have to pay to generate the same amount of revenue for our schools. Um, Brian had mentioned that um, we have an older community. Uh, we had a recent uh, demographic study done and our largest growing age cohort is 65 and older. So we are really a retirement community, uh, a lot of families on that fixed income. So when they supported this levy, they took on the additional tax burden knowing 
it's important for our schools and it's necessary, and a lot of them are on fixed income. So they're fully vested in the community, super grateful for that um, as it goes a long ways. Um, with equalization, um, one thing that um, I recently learned that kind of surprised me, um, there's 44 districts in the metro that have voter approved operating levies. Only two of those actually qualify for equalization aid. All the rest is 100% levy on the taxpayers. So while there's these equalization tiers, these factors within the legislation, those have never been attached to inflation. So as property values have climbed over time, less and less districts are receiving that state aid component to offset the burden on those taxpayers. So what we're really looking for is increasing the tiers and then attaching those to inflation so that it not only benefits South St. Paul Public Schools taxpayers, but it also would benefit all communities across the state in um, balancing out this property tax system. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Um, Senator Klein, you had a comment or question? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the testifiers. And, and uh, it's true that this, uh, to Senator Lucero's question, this bill is specifically only for the city of South St. Paul. Um, and, uh, you know, that's my job is to come here before the committee and stand up for my taxpayers within my district. But I think every single senator at the table has disparities like this in their communities. I appreciate that the plan of the bill is to lay it over for consideration, and I think uh, you know, it hopefully is a metaphor or an allegory for a larger conversation about how we fund, you know, uh, education in the state of Minnesota and how we deal with equalization. So with that, I'll close my comments. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, we do have a question from um, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair. And it's, it's, I guess at this point it's just a comment. But uh, uh, I apologize earlier for jumping the gun because this is definitely near and dear to my heart. So I'll actually lead with... Uh, last night, I, as this committee uh, had invites, I know many of you had uh, conflicts and were not able to attend, but uh, I do, well, there was one member that uh, the staff was able to attend. So I very much appreciate uh, the forum that took place last night at STMA High School, St. Michael Albertville High School, on this exact issue. Low property wealth areas, bedroom communities that lack the commercial industrial. So STMA, I think right now this year is 325 out of 327 school districts. We've been the, one of the bottom five. We've been at the bottom uh, in my eight years in office so far uh, as uh, former representative. It's very frustrating. So every comment that was just made is equally said about not only STME but other school districts in the state. And I appreciate uh, Madam Chair, Senator Klein's uh, comment that this hopefully is, while this is targeted, this before us, this legislation is one district that this could be a jumping or starting point for other stuff to help other districts because last night in the forum, we had teachers, parents, students pouring out their hearts with tears in their eyes about the programs that were cut with the lack of opportunities across the board that they're being deprived because of this exact issue, just being at the bottom consistently year over year. And I, uh, I think it was 77 teachers that were laid off, or staff that was laid off uh, last year. And of those 77, I think it's 55 teachers. And so there's, I think it's expected another 35 if this isn't resolved in this coming uh, school year. Another 35 on top of the 55. I mean, this is devastating for communities such as, as ours. And so uh, again, thank you for this conversation. Uh, I know there's multiple ways to tackle this issue to try to target funding at the bottom. We've had a number of bills. This bill is obviously before us. I introduced two bills, Senate File 504 and 505, different angles. But again, thank you for this. Looking forward to this continued conversation. Thank you, um, Senator Lucero. And I was really disappointed not to be able to meet that, uh, make it to that forum last night. We had a, a meeting, and then um, actually my Columbia Heights uh, a school district was meeting and I heard the very same thing. So this is not new to any of us. And um, if, you, uh, if you are interested in, in having your bills heard, then be sure to get in a request to, to have that bill heard. Thank you. Uh, any more comments? Any oh, question over here, Senator uh, Rarick? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna uh, follow up a little bit. I mean, I love the discussion. Um, I, I'm not crazy about the approach. Um, I could have 12 individual bills because what was described describes every single one of the school districts in, in my district. So um, uh, this is, I think it's been one of the top priorities for a number of years uh, for 
uh, C and a number of other uh, groups that are out there. So I, I love the conversation. This is absolutely what we have to ha um, be talking about. I think um, I've been telling everybody as, as since getting on this committee uh, it is my number two priority. Uh, cross special education cross subsidies number one. This is number two. So. Um, Thank you for bringing it, but I, I do hope that uh, if we're going to have something in the bill around this, it's statewide, not just for individual school districts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Swetsinski. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question for either of you. Uh, do you. Do you have a copy of the referendum question in front of you that you put to the voters? So, uh, who would like to answer that? Uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I do not have a copy in front of me. Okay. Um, but the first question was to revoke our existing levy and replace it with a $900 increase. And then our second question was, in the event that the first question passes, would you approve an additional $250 per student increase? Madam Chair, um, this is perfect. This handout, whoever put this together, applaud their efforts and their work. Uh, the re I didn't mean to, um, the reason I asked about the referendum is you missed the first part of it, um, which says if you vote yes, um, your, tax pay your tax dollars will go up. And it's bugged me for decades, that language, and because it doesn't say an if you vote no. So it's a very unbalanced question. And I either A, would love to see superintendents put pressure on us to somehow remove that language and create the balance that we all want in a democracy so voters have both sides both sides of the issue or remove that if you vote yes to your tax stars because I think it would be easier um, for um, school districts to pass referendums if it didn't have that inflammatory if you vote yes in bold face print on the question. So that's what I was getting at, so thank you. And um, appreciate um, your more efforts. Any other questions? Okay, well with that, I think we will um, go ahead and, um, I'm sorry, did you have any closing comments, Senator Clay? Uh, no, thank you. I think the, the comments of the committee were very apt, and I appreciate uh, the hearing on the bill, Senator Kunesh, or Chair Kunesh. Great. Okay, so with that, um, Senator Umu Verbaden renews her motion to lay um, Senate File 100 at, um, over for possible inclusion in our future omnibus bill. Thank you. Our next bill up is um, Senate File 286. Senator uh, Westland, would you like to um, move that bill for uh, for the com before the committee to lay it over for, for possible inclusion? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, um, Senator Morrison, th welcome to our committee. Uh, would you proceed by briefly introducing your bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, members, thank you for the opportunity to present Senate File 286, which would grant Eastern Carver County Schools the authority to levy for the lease costs of a pupil transportation hub using lease levy authority. Under current laws, you know, a school district may levy the costs of a lease facility if it is for instructional purposes. Eastern Carver County Schools is requesting special authority to allow the district to access new space to update its pupil transportation hub. Senate file 286 authorizes the district to levy for the lease costs of a pupil transportation hub using lease levy authority if the district demonstrates to the commissioner of MDE's satisfaction that the pupil transportation hub will result in significant financial savings for the district and two, the district's overall lease levy remains below $212 per pupil. This bill was included in the House's Education Omnibus Bill last session when I represented Eastern Carver County Schools before redistricting. I have seen the need, and I know that Senator Coleman and I are anxious to grant Eastern Carver County Schools this authority so they can meet the needs of their growing district. Um, and Madam Chair, I'll turn it over to my testifier to speak to that need. Uh, I have Karen DeVette, who is the Director of Finance and Operations for Eastern Carver County Schools, and we're also honored to have Superintendent Lisa Sales-Adams here as well. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, Ms. Devette, would you please state your full name for the record and you may begin. Yes, thank you. My name is Karen Devette and I am the Director of Finance and Operations for Easter Carver County School District. Uh, thank you uh, for your time this morning, Madam Chair and members of the Education Finance Committee. You do have in front of you a handout um, that shows you kind of our current condition of our transportation building with some, some photos so that you can see a little bit for it, uh, it this morning, as well as some information for your review. Um, as uh, Senator Morrison said, we're asking for increased flexibility regarding the building lease levy to allow our school board to um, have the authority to utilize the lease levy to purchase a new transportation facility in another area of our district. Uh, just a note, similar legislative assistance was granted to a, a another school district uh, back in 2014. So this has come before uh, this committee in the past. With more than 9,000 students, Eastern Carver County Schools is one of the larger districts in Minnesota and is projected to grow along with county growth uh, in the uh, as more rural land in the western side of our district is developed. The school district consists of 84, a little bit over 84 square miles and serves the southwest metro cities of Chaska, Chanhassen, Carver, and Victoria. We operate for the school district over 110 routes each day, which covers more than 1.4 million miles annually. We own a bus garage currently on about six acres of land that is located right in downtown Chaska. Uh, with nearly 120 buses, that's six and a half acres, um, which includes 42,000 square feet of storage. Uh, it's really half the size of the facility that we need to house um, the buses and maintain our bus fleet. About, and, and in fact, about 50 of our buses are currently stored outside. Um, in the weather that impacts the life expectancies of that investment, both in the winter and in the summer, uh, and increases costs for items um, to maintain those buses. Excessive fuel while we're idling to get them warmed up and then additional labor cost. This current site that we have at six and a half acres is really too small to accommodate all of the buses that we need to serve our students in Eastern Carver County. And as we grow along with the county, there is really no room for us to expand uh, and add equipment um, to support the expansion of the district. We're not centrally located within our district uh, serving those four communities. So that increases our um, regular operating costs by increasing the miles that we need to travel. We intend that a new transportation facility would provide enough space to store all of our buses inside which will, will increase their life expectancy and reduce the cost that we have with that outdoor storage. Currently, we're levering about 50% of our lease authority, so there is room within um, the $2 or $212 per pupil unit um, for us to do some additional levy. We do have an existing long-term facility maintenance bond that was, that was just um, sold over 10 years. It does include currently a step-down um, in our property tax levy uh, from the debt service due to, and which brings our overall levy down from about 30% in 2022 to just over 20% in 26. So we have done some advanced planning to try to limit the tax impact to our property tax owners because we are committed to considering property tax impact to our residents when we consider these types of investments. We also had discussions with other community leaders in the county and in the city about including some educational facility within the new transportation hub um, and partnering with our municipalities and workforce development, such as career technical education and small and large engine mechanics, as well as training facility for uh, commercial driver's license. Uh, and I think we all know the shortage of CDL uh, drivers within our state and our nation. So we are, uh, to summarize, we're on a, prime location within the downtown city of Chaska. Um, we're actually right off a main entry port to that historic area and commercial district. And I know Chaska uh, has continued to indicate that they're also um, interested in revitalizing that area and um, perhaps with some additional housing uh, for, for that um, space. The current site is also out of compliance with our local zoning ordinance in Chaska because we are storing so many vehicles outside, which also creates some security issues for us. 
Carver County is one of the fastest growing counties in the state, and they're looking for um, ways to plan for this rapid growth and this transportation hub to support the school district would certainly be part of that initiative. So finally, we are asking for increased flexibility related to the building lease levy for the lease purchase of a new transportation facility. We do have the support of the County of Chaska and, uh, I'm sorry, the County of Carver and the City of Chaska um, in this request. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Um, um, Devitt. And so we will move on to um, Superintendent Sales Adams. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the full, uh, for the testimony and you may begin. Good morning, my name is Lisa uh, Sales Adams. I'm the Superintendent of Eastern Carver County Schools and thank you for allowing me to be here this morning. Happy I actually day. came to um, sh provide any additional context but to answer questions. This is my third year as Superintendent in Eastern Carver County Schools. And I recall the first order of business when I got there was a tour of our bus facilities. And although our staff are really proud of our transportation hub and the work that we do, they wanted me to see the conditions. The first thing that I saw when I got there were the conditions of the parking lot, the potholes. Um, from being from the state of Minnesota, you know how this, the uh, tire continues to be paved over. It's bumpy, um, chunks of tire there kind of lane strewn about. When you go into the building, uh, the facilities are not up to par. Uh, we've tried our best to try to repair them, to build onto them, but it's not the facility that we need to ensure that our staff have the facilities to be um, in a really supportive work environment. But on top of that, our fleet of buses, many of our buses are outside. This winter, we've had tons of inclement weather. We've had so much snow storage that we weren't able to use the space that we had to store buses. We've had to park them in the communities, which is also an additional struggle. Um, being able to have this investment in our community would allow us to provide a space, uh, as Karen DeVette did talk about, <coughs> facilities that we could have as instructional areas for CTE, for small engine repair. Um, the community that we have, that we have an opportunity to partner with, I think would be really helpful. So whether it's with the city of Chaska, um, with our other cities that we partner with, having that facility would be very helpful. And I'm available to answer any questions that you have for this bill. Thank you, Superintendent. I think that's a really clever idea to make it a multi-purpose building, such as you, you explained. One question I have is, uh, does the district own this fleet, or is it subcontracted to another? No, we own the fleet. Thank you. Yeah, those are our resources. Okay, thank you. Questions? Um, Senator Cruin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and this kind of relates back to the previous bill that we just discussed. I mean, it seems to me that this should be part of a broader mm -hmm. conversation. I'm a little uncomfortable proceeding on these one-off basis. Um, and I'm just thinking to my own district and whether they perhaps need some flexibility in this area because um, I do love the concept of flexibility, um, and it seems like maybe perhaps we should be having a broader conversation on this as well. Uh, one comment, I love the CTE um, component of this, um, and if I were on your school board, I certainly would be um, asking questions about that. Um, and, and I do have a couple of questions, well, but I'm, I'm, I'm even a little uncomfortable asking these questions because I don't believe this committee should be a super school board over every district in this state. Um, but we are where we are and this bill is before us. So um, I'm, I'm curious what, and, and if you answered this, I apologize if you answered, answered this question in your presentation, but what are you gonna do with the, the property where your current hub sits um, if this were to come to fruition? Ms. Debit. Yes, thank you, uh, Senator Kuhn. We anticipate that uh, the city of Chaska will be interested in the property. They had expressed interest uh, when we attempted to uh, make this shift back in 2019 uh, for centralizing some of their uh, city and county services. They have since moved forward with that, but in recent conversations with the city manager, um, they're looking at redeveloping, purchasing and redeveloping the site, uh, potentially for more housing or other ways uh, to revitalize that area. Senator Krug, follow-up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so presumably that would be bringing some revenue into your school district. My second question would be, um, could the school district 
um, seek voter approval for a bond issue to build this transportation hub? And if so, why is that not being pursued? Ms. Devitt? Yes, thank you. Uh, the school district did seek uh, bond authority in 2019. And that particular referendum question, this was a part of the overall bonding request. And that particular referendum uh, question was not passed by the voters. We did have a subsequent successful operating uh, referendum passed in 2021. But honestly, I don't know that a transportation facility really uh, necessarily resonates, you know, as would uh, adding onto a school or building a new building uh, for education. So um, trying to go out to them for this particular ask right now doesn't seem very prudent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Rarick, you had a question? Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And that, that was part of my question. I was wondering um, if you had... Uh, you said that the city and the, the county were in favor, but I was wondering what the, the residents, were, where they were at with this. Um, I do think this is part of a broader discussion in, in general. Uh, you know, again, I think a lot of school districts would like this instead of doing this for one individual district. But I do think some of this, um, the, you know, big discussion on this is why were some of these provisions put in place? Um, I think part of it was... Um, for taxpayers uh, to have some of that protection and to make sure that uh, they have a say in what uh, is happening. Um, I do appreciate, though, that it um, part of the bill is saying that you have to stay under that $212 uh, cap. So um, I think it's a, a good discussion, but again, should probably be something um, overall, not just for individual school districts, or we'll have, what is it, 200 and some individual bills in front of us. So. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. You bet. And, you know, we can, we can say it's, it's really tough to do all these individual ones, but when we think about opportunities that we've had in the past to either have these discussions or to um, make some kind of a, a, a good plan, and that hasn't happened, and so this is, in essence, the beginning of that discussion. Um, but in the meantime, if there are school districts that have um, put together a plan to basically help themselves, um, I think that we need to support them in the best way that we can without um, ignoring the big problem and addressing that as well. So I hope we do have some of those broader conversations. Uh, Senator uh, Farnsworth, you had a question? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I apologize if I also missed this. I see the number five million on this, on this handout. So is that the estimated total cost for this project? Uh, the Ms. Five, Devitt? Sorry. The five million, sir, is what we believe um, the current estimate of deferred maintenance if we were try, to try to repair our existing building. Um, there's many components of the building envelope as well as the internal spaces um, that need uh, renewal. The total project estimate right now, including purchase of land, is right around 15 million. Uh, our intention in the district would be to utilize the lease levy authority that we have available to us as well as pay-as-you-go and some other um, assigned funds that, that we have. Follow-up? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so um, there's, there's two things that this, um, I think this group is going to get tired of hearing me talk about over the next four years. One, of course, will be the special ed cross subsidy. The other will be um, trying to sneak support for mining into every possible thing, uh, and I wouldn't be doing my job carrying on Senator Tomasoni's legacy if I didn't do that. Uh, and so I just want to talk about the Permanent School Trust Fund, which is a trust fund that is paid from the proceeds of uh, natural resources owned by the state. Um, of, the, of the trust fund, each, each student in Minnesota, uh, schools are awarded $57 per student. Um, that's paid for, the trust fund has been built 90% from mining, 10% from logging, which is mostly um, northern Minnesota, and then 5% from, uh, from land sales. And, and so looking uh, at the distribution of the permanent tr school trust fund, I see that Eastern uh, Carver County last year, or this year um, qualified for $421,868.58 of that fund. Now. The reason I bring this up is that we have potential mining projects in northern Minnesota, one of them, uh, the Twin Metals Project, that is projected to triple or quadruple the size of that trust fund, which would mean that in an instance like this where the school district 
um, needs a substantial amount of money, um, potentially within 15 years, and this is DNR um, estimates, not, you know, not the company estimates, within 15 to 20 years, that trust fund could triple or quadruple, and Eastern Carver County could get uh, about 1.6, 1.7 million, uh, million dollars. Um, <clears throat> and so I would encourage um, everybody that's listening um, to support mining and uh, to do everything that in their power to support mining because it supports school districts, it supports students, and uh, hopefully the author of this bill will consider supporting um, these mining projects that will help to support students across the state. Thank you. Thank you for that education on our school trust lands. I'm sure we will be discussing it in the future. Uh, any other questions? Any um, parting remarks then, Senator Morrison? Uh, no, Madam Chair, but I want to thank you, Madam Chair, and members for your consideration of this bill. This would make a huge difference in, for Eastern Carver County Schools in what is one of the fastest growing areas in our state. The need is real. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you so much. And with that, um, Senator Westland renews her motion to lay uh, Senate File 286 over for possible inclusion in our future omnibus bill. Thank you. Next, we will um, hear from Senator Dreheim on his Senate File 237. Senator Dreheim, if you'd like to join us. Thank you, Chair and, and uh, committee members. Senator Lucero, would you like to make a motion to move Senate File 237 before the committee? So move, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, and as we go forward, um, welcome to our committee, Senator Dreheim. You may proceed briefly to introduce your bill and um, uh, let us know what you need to, to let us know. Okay, thank you, and, and thanks for having me. Um, we're going to switch gears, members, a little bit. We just heard from probably one of the more wealthiest areas of the state, and we're going the other end, and, and this is the smaller school districts that don't have any tax base, but minute small school districts, 550 kids and smaller in a school. Um, and I, I have two active teenagers between chasing them around, watching friends and family at sporting events or, or different activities um, across the state, you get into a lot of different schools. My new district, I think, touches at least 20 different school districts. 20 different school districts. And a lot of them are smaller. And I, I've done a lot of different bills over the last six years on accessibility. So you start paying attention to facilities around schools. And you notice things that should be done that aren't done. And when you ask questions, it comes down to the same thing we've heard today with the other bills. It's about money, it's about funding. So I thought we should create a program, a pilot program here, one-time spending, that is flexible, Chair, <laughs> when you're working through your budget process this year. Um, it, it can be massaged, um, but we have the framework to help out accessibility in facilities in the smaller schools that might have one or two commercial properties in town besides the gas station or convenience store, maybe a liquor store, a couple churches, um, no tax base. What do they do? You know, we, we heard about a bus garage. Um, you know, the, the school that my kids go to, I think they have five buses, five buses. When they have after school activities, they have to wait for the routes to come back so they can take a bus to go travel an hour for a sports activity or some other activity at, at school. Um, so different schools are different and there's pros and cons with all of them. But one thing we should try to accomplish is make sure kids are not left out because they have 
different needs than the average kid. And that includes not just in the classroom, but that's going to a football game or going to a play or a band concert or anything else. And that's what this bill tries to do, Chair. I, I think there's a letter of support from the Council of Disability, if you members didn't see that. And, and pretty simple. I appreciate your, your hearing the bill. Very massageable on the numbers and the scope as you see fit, Chair, as you move through with your omnibus bill. Thank you, Senator Drahan. Do you have do you have an idea of a number that you would like to start with or plug in there? Do you have any idea how many of these um, small school districts are in need of um, uh, creating that ADA accessibility within their schools? You know, until we put up the program, you know, I, I, at the schools that I've talked to, a lot of them have people in the community that would help pitch in to make up, because, you know, I think we had 150,000 cap on this, so if it's a 50-50 gap, or 50-50 split, um, so most of these schools would have a hard time raising 150,000. I mean, and where that's how tight their budgets are. Um, so they're gonna have to rely on partnerships and, and local farmers or, or business people that live in the district or their kids go to school in the districts to help fund that. Um, I, I don't think we need a lot, but I also think we could expand the size of the schools. So this is kind of a pilot project that I, I think is worthy uh, that we should be helping those so no one feels left out. So you could raise that 550 up and you'd get more schools. Um, so, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to you offline on a number. I didn't want to put a number in there because I've been in your shoes trying to do a budget at the end of the year and anything we can do will help out and I appreciate it. Thank you. Any questions? Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hi, Senator Dreheim. Dreheim, am I saying it right? I'm sorry. Um, I just want to say I appreciate you being here. I'm from a small town. I think I agree with what Senator Cruen is saying, though. It does feel today like we're sort of like a super school district or a super, uh, school board. Um, but I also think, too, that if, um, you know, if a school is feeling like they are in um, that, that, that things are so bad that they sort of need to put together a legislative plan and go to their representative or their senator, then it must mean that the need is pretty great and pretty real. Um, you know, we talk a lot about making schools more equitable and accessible, and I think that this bill fits in with that perfectly. So um, I just want to say thank you for that, uh, for bringing this forward, um, and good luck. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Senator, I do have a couple, another question. So it says in your bill that the district receives a grant under this section must match the grant with local district funds. What if there are no, what if there aren't sufficient local funds? How would you imagine that happen, working out? Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, maybe, maybe we need to add some language as this bill moves forward, um, a local match okay. um, and broaden that up a little bit because I, I do think it will be hard for some of these smaller schools to come up with an extra hundred thousand or fifty thousand or or whatever it would be well I, I do like this bill as well I want to make sure that uh, all of our schools have the accessibility for not only the students but for family members or community members to enjoy the buildings that that they have there as well so I, I think this bill needs a little bit of work but I am very much interested in if you're interested in um, like making it a little more robust I would be more than happy to work with you on that and see what we can put together I appreciate it, Chair. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, uh, we have Senator Farnsworth over there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Dreheim. Um, just a quick question. So, um, so this bill is to try and get the small schools back to ADA compliance. And, and if you don't have the answer to this question, that's fine. I'm just curious. Do you know, so the schools are currently not compliant. Um, is there some sort of punitive thing that, that, um, that the government is, you know, Defining them or something for not being in compliant and so there would be a, a benefit of course financially Or is it something that's sort of sort of overlooked? Senator Drahan. 
Thank you. I, and I, I don't have the answer. I do not believe any school is being fined for this. I think most schools try to do the right thing, but it comes down to funding. And I, I think a lot of schools have maybe one option, maybe someone with a mobility issue to move around, but not the same as all the other kids. And, and I think part of it is, and, and the chair ch touched on it a little bit, not just the kids, it's their parents, it's their grandparents. You know, if, if you wanted to go watch your kid at a band concert and you couldn't get in to see them, I, I mean, your kid would feel bad and, and of course you would feel bad. So it's the facilities in general and, and we do have pretty strict rules on the general population out in public, but I, I, I know I had a bill probably five years ago on accessibility in government buildings because there were some exemptions for state buildings. Now schools don't fall under that from what I remember. Um, but I, I think I'm more of one that if we see a problem, we should try to address it. And, and that's what we're trying to do here. And I, I don't know if anybody's getting fined. I don't, I've never heard of anybody getting fined. So I don't think that would be the case. Follow up? All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, then with that, um, Senator Draheim, thank you for bringing this uh, forward. It's really something uh, that I would like to ponder and like to learn more. And if you are interested in working uh, more to bring this bill into a, a good form, uh, I'd be very, more than interested. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So, uh, and with that, uh, Senator Gustafson renews her motion to lay this bill over for possible inclusion. Lucero, Senators Lucero. Okay, thank you. All right, our last bill of the day. Get through my papers here. Okay. Senate File 132, um, Senator Port has a bill to fund transfer authorization for independent school district number 191. Welcome to our committee, Senator Port. And let's see, Senator Swadzinski, would you like to make a motion to move Senate File 132 for the committee to lay over for possible inclusion? So moved. Thank you. Uh, welcome to our committee. As I said, um, would you, um, Senator Port, if you would like to briefly introduce your bill, and then we will hear from your testifiers. Thank you so much, Chair Kunish and committee members. I'm here today to present Senate File 132, a bill for fund transfer for ISD 191. The school district is in the process of selling a property after closing a school a few years ago. With this bill, the district would still be required to pay off all debt and debt service first, but any remaining funds would be able to be deposited in the general fund for the district. This allows the district the leeway to use the funds as they need now for literacy and learning for students. Our schools have faced tremendous challenges over the last several years, and this fund transfer will help make sure that our students are receiving the investments they need. I have two testifiers, including Dr. Teresa Battle, the superintendent from 191, to talk about the ways the district plans to use the funds. Thank you for your time and consideration. I ask for your support. Thank you, Senator Port. Um, welcome, Superintendent Battle. If you would like to state your full name for the record, and you may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Port, and thank you to Education Finance uh, Committee members. I am Dr. Teresa Battle, the Superintendent of Burnsville Egan Savage, District 191, and joining me today for moral support and any possible questions is our Board of Education Chair, uh, Mr. Scott Hume. So the District 191 Board of Education is seeking a legislative exemption related to the sale of one or more properties, which are no longer being used due to decreased enrollment. The exemption would allow any proceeds of the sale beyond what's required to pay off of the building's existing debt to be transferred to the district's unassigned general fund and used for programming expenses instead of only for capital expenditures. The board has discussed potential uses for any proceeds. The primary purpose of the exemption would be for the board to be able to use the funds in a way that best meets needs of our local 
uh, students, families, and staff members. It puts control in the local community through the school board. So this would most likely mean using the funding for more than one purpose, but on programming aligned with our district's community-driven priorities. For example, we have launched a pre-K-12 uh, pathways model, which is designed to support each student in finding their passion and preparing them for success after graduation. We have also launched early literacy programming, which is foundational to our core work, and we have extended that literacy work through all of our grades. And then lastly, it will allow the district to respond to a need that they are currently unaware of at this time, such as a capital improvement due to any enrollment changes. And with that, I thank you for your time and ask for your support for this bill. Thank you, Superintendent Battle. Uh, question, Senator Rick? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, as you were uh, talking about uh, explaining, so I, my understanding is, like, if we don't pass this, you are only able to use the funds for capital expenditures. And so, I, I am wondering, um, you're, in your last, as you were ending, you talked about some potential capital expenditures that the district uh, isn't aware of, or, or was that just potential? And so, I guess better way of phrasing my question is, um, is it the case that the district really doesn't have uh, any capital expenditures that they would need to use and that you have other needs that you feel are of much more importance and is, that's why you're coming uh, to the committee looking for this exemption? Uh, Superintendent Battle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. So it allows the school board to have flexibility so currently, we do have space to grow in our current school facilities. But as you know, there could be development in the cities we serve, Burnsville, Egan, and Savage. So currently, actually in Burnsville, we had a new apartment open um, and we experienced some increased growth unexpected. And there are some additional apartments being built in our cities. So for the future, we're unsure of how many more, uh, how, how, how our enrollment will grow. And so it gives the school board that flexibility. So at this current time, we do have room in our schools that we can uh, address um, some enrollment growth. But for the future, as I tell you, we don't know because of the apartment growth. And so it gives that flexibility to maintain our programming, which is so desired by our students and families. After 2019, uh, the board had to make some very difficult decisions and cuts in programming, which include uh, music classes, as well as uh, uh, college in the schools classes and other desired programming. Um, through some very good financial efforts of the district and uh, thankful to our uh, Taxpayers, they did pay us an operating levy. We have been, and with the federal COVID funds, we've been able to restore some of that. But going forward, as you know, that's not sustainable as the federal funds will be leaving. So it really gives that flexibility for uses, not only for capital, as the current law stands, for any proceeds from a sale of uh, one of our school buildings or properties. Follow up. Thank you. Senator uh, Sarah. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question would be for the chief author or the superintendent or whoever can answer. On the regard to the current law, as we are always, uh, when these bills come before and are seeking to change explicit uh, law, I'm always uh, interested in knowing why was it set up that way to begin with, if you have knowledge. So why, my question is, why was the sale or lease of property in a past legislature explicitly, explicitly dedicating those funds then to capital spending. Superintendent Battle, do you have an answer for that? Thank you, Madam Chair. I would defer to Senator Port. I would never speak on behalf, even though I'm an elder, I have many years in this business, I would never speak on behalf of legislatures about what they were thinking when they proposed that bill. <laughs> and, and Madam Chair, if I could just add, the reason, the, the motivation for the question is just simply, as we are considering potential changes, whatever variables or factors might have been there originally, are they still there, and should we consider them as we make changes? Senator Port. 
Thank you, Chair Kunish and Senator Lucero. Um, much like Dr. Battle, I, I wasn't here and won't uh, put intent on it, but my understanding of it is that investments are made from this legislature into properties uh, for schools often uh, with state investments. And so when those same properties are sold, the intent is to keep that money in properties for schools, uh, sort of public good properties. Um, and so that's my that's my understanding of it is is that they don't want money that is invested from the state to just be able to be immediately sold off and used for something else. Uh, we have to come to the legislature for approval for you know sort of to shift that money to something else. And because the district doesn't at this moment have a need for capital investment. Um, we're asking to instead move this to the general fund. And I will note that this, um, we did hear this bill last year and it, uh, we even it made it all the way to the floor um, and did pass 66 uh, to nothing. So um, we hope for your support again this year. Thank you, Senator Port. Follow up. Uh, uh, Senator Cruin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and, and I know you testified on this, um, I guess, Superintendent, but I, is this um, for one building or two buildings? What, what's contemplated in this again? Uh, Superintendent Battle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator, currently we have uh, three buildings that are not school buildings that are not in use. Two by board resolution we are leasing. Um, the other building, we do have a purchase agreement, the Metcalf uh, Middle School. We do have a purchase agreement. Senator Crood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, going to the, I don't want to turn this into a Judiciary Committee, <laughs> but going to the, the, the language in the bill, it references, it says specifically identified in the district's Open Facilities Action Plan um, is this like a static document or what are, what are we doing here? Are we giving, is this an open document that can be changed and this is an ongoing thing or is it only for those buildings that are currently specifically identified in that action plan? Senator, uh, excuse me, Superintendent uh, Battle. Thank you, Chair. Senator, the open facilities plan is not an, it's, uh, not a one-year plan. It's a multi-year plan that's updated annually um, based on my recommendations by the board. The first part of the plan was actually the closure of those three sites. And so I defer to my board chair if he would like to add some more information about their review process. So the plan, it's an ongoing. Uh, we look at all of our facilities based on our needs, um, conditions, and other factors. Um, Would you please uh, state your full name for the record, then you may begin. Yes. Um, I'm Scott Hume. I am the board chair in the school, Burnsville okay. Eaton Savage School District. Um, I guess just adding on to what Dr. Battle was mentioning, um, we do review the, the open facilities plan annually. Um, as part of that review process, I think that the idea is that what, how can we best utilize our open facilities in a way that supports the current and potential future needs of the district, which is how we've identified um, the potential sale of, as Dr. Battle mentioned, Metcalf Middle School as um, what we are focusing on currently. Um, yes. Thank you. Any okay. follow-up? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is if there's three buildings right now and that's what we're being asked to consider, what, what if sometime down the road a fourth building gets added to this plan? Is it covered under what we're looking at today? Mr. Hume, do you know or Senator Bort? Thank you, Chair Kunish and Senator Kroon. Um, we have discussed this and would be happy to work with Senator Kunish uh, as this bill moves forward uh, to include that it is the 2023 plan. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Wonderful. Well, thank you um, so much, Senator Port, for bringing this to us, and uh, Superintendent, and, and your guest, uh, 
to bring us up to um, speed on this bill. Uh, and so with that, Senator Swadzinski renews his motion to lay Senate File 132 over for possible inclusion in our omnibus bill. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We have no more bills uh, uh, before us, members. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.